write down the scripture references as we look at them today. We're going to read in Ephesians chapter 3. I want to remind you that for some time now, in fact, ever since we've been on this program, uh, I've attempted to show you that there is a period of time referred to in the Bible as the dispensation of the grace of God. Uh, during this dispensation of grace, God is not judging or condemning the world. God is not pouring out his wrath upon the world, but during this period of time of grace, God Almighty is saving souls, he's saving sinners uh, by his grace, which is made available to us through the death of Jesus Christ at Calvary. I have discussed that. There are basically two positions today pertaining to uh, uh, this grace. There is that apostate fundamentalist attitude that says that God Almighty saved everybody by grace through faith throughout the Bible. The attempt to take the grace of God that is referred to through Paul and apply that grace into all other dispensations with the idea in mind to make it so that men had eternal life by believing in all dispensations. The idea is to make it appear as if Abraham uh, in Genesis chapter 15 and in Genesis chapter 22 uh, realized totally and completely that Jesus Christ was going to come and die for your sins. Then the other side of this is the attitude of the Pentecostalist, Church of Christ, Catholics, Mormons, Seventh-day Adventists, on and on and on. These people say that there never has been, nor is there now, such a thing as the eternal security of the believer. They say that no one can be saved and know that they're saved that you cannot know you're saved until you get to heaven or whatever it is. Most of them take the attitude that your salvation is dependent upon your good works versus your bad. The idea that God Almighty someday is going to weigh your good works versus the bad. If your good works outweigh the bad, God will invite you to enter into his kingdom, uh, into everlasting bliss and all that kind of business. What is so fascinating is that the Pentecostals and the Assembly of God and people like that down through the years have sort of fine-tuned their teaching along that line. You see, they don't teach now the, exactly that same doctrine of uh, your good works versus your bad. They teach the rapture of the church, the tribulation, and the second coming of Christ, so they had to kind of fine-tune it. So they say now, that you can be saved and know that you're saved as long as you don't live in sin. They say that you cannot be saved without repentance, that is, turning away from your sins, and that you must do this and then trust Christ, and that the grace of God is available to you if you live for God. The idea being that if you're good, if you're repentant, and you live for the Lord and whatever, then God is gracious unto you, and his death at Calvary will be applied to you, and that you can have salvation through his death. The Church of Christ believes, basically, that Jesus Christ died for the church. But to have salvation, you must be in the church, and to get in the church, you must be baptized in water, uh, into the church for which Christ died. And this, this goes on and on and on. Now, what I'm going to talk to you about is not an attitude that I'm right and everybody else is wrong. That is not the idea at all. I'm probably the dumbest of them all. But being as dumb as I am, I believe the Bible. You see, I'm a fool for Christ. The Bible tells me in 1 Corinthians chapter 1 that not many wise men after the flesh, not many mighty, not many noble are called, but God has chosen the foolish things of the world to confound the wise, and on and on. And I'm just fool enough to believe that the King James Bible is the Word of God, 
and that the King James Bible, the Word of God, means exactly what it says, as it says it, where it says it. I do not need a Greek scholar to interpret the passages for me. There are people today that are running to the Greek to find out the meaning of the English, and they can't read English, nor can they read Greek. And the answer to the whole thing for them is wisdom, scholarship. They believe the doctor, but they won't believe the Bible. They believe the philosophy, but they won't believe the Bible. How about you? What do you believe? Now, I want us to talk about this again today, and I want to, you to notice that Paul is given the dispensation of the grace of God. Now, you cannot understand the difference in Paul's teaching and Peter's teaching unless you understand the dispensational views in the Bible. So if you'll permit me, I want to put on the board again today the chart that we use regularly all the time, and I'll say that this right here represents the first coming of Christ. That's his baptism there. His crucifixion is right here. Therefore, between here is Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. Jesus Christ in those books is the apostle to Israel. The Bible says in Hebrews chapter 3 that he's the apostle of God. All right, his apostleship is to Israel. The Bible tells me that Jesus Christ came unto Israel and they received him not. Jesus Christ's ministry then is to Israel. He sent the apostles out in Matthew 10 and said, Go not in the way of the Gentiles, go only to the lost sheep of the house of Israel. And he said in Matthew chapter 15, I'm not sent but unto the lost sheep of the house of Israel. Now you'd think that anybody that believed the Bible at all would believe that, but not so. You see people always run to the Greek to find out if that's true or not. And they get themselves in a mess because God Almighty doesn't bless them any longer. God blesses the people that just believe the Bible without question. You see, we walk by faith, not by sight. And the Bible tells me clearly in Hebrews chapter 11 that Faith is the substance of things which are hoped for, the things which are not seen, and on and on. They that come to God must believe that He is, and that He's a reward of them that diligently seek Him. You see, faith has to do with believing something without questioning it. Now, on the other side, I'm going to put over here, and I'm going to say that this right here is the second coming of the Lord Jesus Christ. Jesus Christ is going to come again. He promised the apostles that he's going to come again. And he said, when the Son of Man shall come in his glory, and all the holy angels with him, then he'll sit upon the throne of his glory. Uh, back here, uh, the angel of the Lord told Mary, fear not, you're going to bear a son. Call his name Jesus. He shall be great, called the Son of the Highest, and the Lord God shall give unto him the throne of his father David. Obviously, he didn't get the throne of his father David at his first coming. He's going to come again, and he's going to reign, and that's clear in Revelation chapter 19 and 20. Revelation chapter 1 verse 7 says, He cometh with clouds, and every eye shall see him, and they also which pierced him, and on and on. Well, anybody then that believes the Bible believes that Jesus Christ is coming again. Anybody that doesn't believe that Jesus Christ is coming again doesn't believe their Bible. Anybody that believes the Bible believes Jesus is coming again. Anybody that doesn't believe Jesus is coming again doesn't believe their Bible. It's that simple. Now, before he comes again, there is a period of time in the Bible referred to as the time of Jacob's trouble that I want to talk to you about in a moment. If I come on the other side back here, I'm going to let this represent the salvation of the Apostle Paul. This would be Acts chapter 9. In Acts chapter 9, the Lord appeared to the Apostle Paul and he appeared to him brighter than the noonday sun and the message of grace came down to the Apostle Paul at that point. The church which is the body of Christ is saved by grace through faith so the Lord is going to appear again and the church, the finished product which is the fullness of Christ is going to go up. 
In other words, the church, which is the body of Christ, is formed by the preaching of that grace message. It is formed in that dispensation of grace. And when that church is full, it's called the fullness of Christ. Uh, when that church is full, then that body of Christ will go up to meet the Lord in the air. Our vile bodies will be changed, made like unto his glorious body, and so shall we ever be with the Lord. After which, the wrath of God is going to fall on this world. Now, notice first, this dispensation of grace, and so I put in here, grace as such. Now, notice what the Bible says about it in Ephesians chapter 3. In Ephesians 3 verse 1, For this cause I, Paul, the prisoner of Jesus Christ, for you Gentiles, if you have heard of the dispensation of the grace of God, which is given me to you, well then Paul was given the dispensation of the grace of God. Turn please to uh, Colossians chapter 1. In Colossians chapter 1, Notice in verse 23, we're going to read at the very latter part of the verse. Verse 23, I, Paul, he said, am made a minister, verse 24, who now rejoice in my sufferings for you and fill up that which is behind of the afflictions of Christ in my flesh for his body's sake, which is the church. You see, just as Jesus Christ suffered for your sins at Calvary, the Apostle Paul suffered to bring you the message that Jesus had suffered for your sins. So he filled up the sufferings of Christ for the church, the body of Christ. Now, in verse uh, 25, whereof I am made a minister according to the dispensation of God which is given to me for you to fulfill the word of God, even the mystery which hath been hid from ages and from generations, but now is made manifest to his saints. Well, then there is a dispensation of God that's called the dispensation of the grace of God that is in this Bible. Now, I realize that somebody is going to go rushing to the bookshelf, grab the Greek down, listen to what the Greek scholar had to say about it, and they're going to find out that that Greek scholar said that the word dispensation is the same word as just dispensing something out. <laughs> well, that is true, but it takes time to dispense something out. And the grace of God began to be dispensed in Acts chapter 9 and will cease to be dispensed at the rapture of the church. Therefore, between the two appearings, when Jesus appeared to Paul in Acts 9 and when he appears as in 2 Timothy chapter 4 and the church goes up to the judgment seat of Christ, between those two appearings there is the dispensation or the dispensing out of the grace of God in a period of time. And I couldn't care less about the arguments with some scholarly individual who doesn't believe the Bible in the first place, but all he's trying to do is reject the truth and get you to reject the truth. I don't care anything about that. I realize that we in America today live in the Republican dispensation. In other words, a Repub Republican form of government. In the world today, God's government is a form of grace. In other words, God is gracious to all individuals on the face of this earth today. God is not judging men today. God is dispensing his grace out to men today. The Bible says in 2 Corinthians 5.19 that God was in Christ reconciling the world unto himself, not imputing their trespasses unto them. And may I say to you again that God can save you right now based upon the fact that he's gracious to you and he's gracious unto you because Christ died for your sins at Calvary. It matters not how low down you are. It matters not how sorry you are. It matters not how immoral you are. It matters not how sinful you are. Jesus Christ died for sinners. Jesus Christ died for ungodly sinners. Jesus Christ died for ungodly sinners that are enemies to Almighty God. And God can save you right now if you will believe in Christ 
trusting that he died for your sins at Calvary, but God will not save you right now based upon your works. You can repent of your sins until hell freezes over, but if you do not believe in and completely and totally trust that Christ paid for your sins at Calvary and depend upon his work at Calvary to save your soul, you will end up in hell as sure as you're listening to my voice. And all that business about trusting Christ and then falling from grace because you used tobacco or alcohol or dance or played cards is just blowing smoke. There isn't anything to that. God Almighty paid for your sins at Calvary. God will save your soul if you will trust Christ as your Savior. We live in the dispensation of the grace of God. Notice Paul's term in 1 Corinthians chapter 9. In 1 Corinthians chapter 9, notice in verse 16. 1 Corinthians 9, 16, Paul said, For though I preach the gospel, I have nothing to glory of. For necessity is laid upon me, yea, woe is unto me if I preach not the gospel. For if I do this thing, that is, preach the gospel, willing, I have a reward, but if against my will a dispensation of the gospel is committed unto me. The point being that Paul is committed <clears throat> a dispensation. The, dispensa the dispensation of the gospel is committed to the apostle Paul. And so Paul dispenses out the grace of God. He issues forth the grace of God. Where do you find this grace of God in a King James Bible? Well, you find it in Romans through Philemon. Now that is clear to a Bible believer. Now let's compare some things. Once the rapture takes place, and it is clear that it will, 1 Thessalonians chapter 4 said, The Lord himself shall descend from heaven with a shout, with the voice of the archangel, with the trump of God, and the dead in Christ shall rise first. Then we that are alive and remain shall be caught up together with them in clouds to meet the Lord in the air, so shall we ever be with the Lord. The Bible tells me in Philippians chapter 3 that our vile bodies are going to be changed and made like unto his glorious body. In other words, then the Lord is going to call us out and we call that the rapture. I realize that the Church of Christ preachers get all out of shape and all beside themselves and they say, well, you can't find the word rapture in a King James Bible. <laughs> well, no one said you can. But the truth of the catching out, we should be caught up together. The truth of that catching up is a rapture, and if you don't believe that, get your dictionary down and check the word and see if that isn't true. We're going to be caught up to meet the Lord in the air, and then there's going to be a time of trouble on this world. Now let's look about that. Turn in your Bible, please, to Jeremiah, and we're just going to believe the Bible. Look in Jeremiah chapter 30. In Jeremiah chapter 30, notice in verse 4, Jeremiah 30, verse 4, these are the words that the Lord spake concerning Israel and concerning Judah. For thus saith the Lord, we have heard a voice of trembling, of fear, and not of peace. Ask you now and see whether a man doth travail with child. Wherefore do I see every man with his hands on his loins, as a woman in travail, and all faces are turned into paleness? Alas, for that day is great, so that none is like it. It is even the time of Jacob's trouble, but he, Jacob, shall be saved out of it. Well, then there is a time of Jacob's trouble. We know that time of Jacob's trouble is not before the cross back here. There is no such time referred to in the Bible. There, it is not in Acts chapter 2 through 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, and on and on. It is not in Romans through Philemon. There is a time of Jacob's trouble, and God is going to be dealing with Jacob, the nation Israel, during that time of trouble. Turn please to Isaiah, and look in Isaiah chapter 13. 
Isaiah chapter 13. During this time of Jacob's trouble, the world is going to get it. In Isaiah chapter 13, notice in verse 6, Howl ye, for the day of the Lord is at hand. It shall come as a destruction from the Almighty. Therefore shall all hands be faint, and every man's heart shall melt, and they shall be afraid. Pangs and sorrow shall take hold of them. They shall be in pain as a woman that travaileth. They shall be amazed one at another. Their faces shall be as flames. Behold, the day of the Lord cometh, cruel, both with wrath and fierce anger, to lay the land desolate. He shall destroy the sinners thereof out of it. For the stars of heaven and the constellations thereof shall not give their light. The sun shall be darkened in his going forth, and the moon shall not cause her light to shine. And I'll punish the world for their evil, and the wicked for their iniquity. I'll cause the arrogancy of the proud to cease, and the low lay low the haughtiness of the terrible. I'll make a man more precious than fine gold, even a man than the uh, golden wedge of Ophir. Therefore I will shake the heavens, and the earth shall remove out of her place in the wrath of the Lord of hosts, and in the day of his fierce anger. Make no mistake about it. There is a day coming God's going to judge this world. He's going to judge this world in righteousness. He's going to bring forth his wrath, and he's going to melt the dross out of this world as a man puts silver in fire. Notice that that's what he says about Israel. Turn in your Bible, please, and look in Zechariah chapter 13. In Zechariah, notice in Zechariah 13, verse uh, 7. Zechariah 13, verse 7. Awake, O sword, against thy shepherd, and against the man that is thy fellow, saith the Lord of hosts. Smite the shepherd, and the sheep shall be scattered, which he did at Calvary, you see. And I'll, uh, I will turn mine hand upon the little ones. All right, he smote the shepherd back here. The sheep were scattered. The sheep is Israel. They've been scattered among the nations. Uh, verse 8, It shall come to pass that all the land, saith the Lord, two parts therein shall be cut off and die, but the third shall be left therein. In other words, uh, Israel was carried captive among the nations. A remnant of Israel was left in the land. Verse 9, I'll bring the third part through the fire and will refine them as silver is refined, and will try them as gold is tried. They shall call on my name, and I will hear them. I will say, It is my people, and they shall say, The Lord is my God. Well, now you know that wasn't at the first coming of Christ. How do you know? Look at the next ver ne uh, next chapter. Behold, the day of the Lord cometh. We read about the day of the Lord back in Isaiah. Uh, thy spoils shall be divided in the midst of thee. I'll gather all nations against Jerusalem to battle. Hadn't done it yet. And the city shall be taken, and the houses rifle. The women ravished. Half of the city shall go forth into captivity. The residue of the people shall not be cut off from the city. In other words, the Israel nation is going to be regathered back into Palestine again before the coming of the Lord. Verse 3, Then shall the Lord go forth and fight against those nations which he did not do at his first coming back here. And you know that's true if you believe the Bible. As when he fought in the day of battle, verse 4, His feet shall stand in that day upon the Mount of Olives, second coming, which is before Jerusalem on the east, and the Mount of Olives shall cleave in the midst thereof toward the east and toward the west. Uh, <coughs> excuse me. And there shall be a very great valley, and half of the mountain shall remove toward the no north, and half of it toward the south, and on and on he goes. Look in verse uh, 9. The Lord shall be the king over all the earth in that day. Uh, shall there be one Lord, and his name one. Uh, come to verse 16. It shall come to pass that every one that is left of all the nations which came against Jerusalem shall even go up from year to year to worship the King, the Lord of hosts, and to keep the Feast of Tabernacles. Well, you know that isn't happening today. You know that the Lord did not fight against the nations of this world at His first coming. In fact, the nations of this world were gathered against Him. According to uh, Psalms, and Peter quotes the Psalms in Acts chapter 4, and he says there that uh, the kings and the kings of this earth are united against the Holy One and uh, 
the kings of this world against him and on and on. They united against him by care. They said, crucify him. We have no king but Caesar. And so the Gentiles put him to death back there at Calvary and Israel consented unto it, brought it about and whatever. Christ never fought against the nations. He went out to the Mount of Olives after his resurrection and he went up and the clouds received him out of their sight at that time. <clears throat> the apostles stood there and watched him as he went up. And the two men in white, the angels of the Lord, stood by them and said, You men of Galilee, why stand you gazing up into heaven? This same Jesus that you've seen go into heaven shall come in like manner as you've seen him go. Well, Zechariah chapter 14, he's going to come again. He's going to come and when he comes again, he's going to stand on the Mount of Olives. And when he comes again, he's going to fight against the nations of this world who are going to come against Jerusalem at that time. He's going to fight against them and this is clear in the book of Revelation and it's called Armageddon. And when he comes again and fights against them, there's going to be a dividing of that mountain and uh, uh, the land is going to be level there and the children of Israel are going to be saved at that time. Turn please to uh, Zechariah chapter 12 and look in Zechariah chapter 12, verse 10. Context, second coming. Zechariah 12, 10. I'll pour upon the house of David and upon the inhabitants of Jerusalem the spirit of grace and of supplications, and they shall look upon me whom they have pierced as in Revelation chapter 1 verse 7, and he goes on and on. Look in chapter 13 verse 1. In that day, second coming of Christ, there shall be a fountain open to the house of David and to the inhabitants of Jerusalem for sin and for uncleanness. Turn please to Romans, and look how Paul refers to this. In Romans chapter 11, Romans chapter 11, context the fall of Israel, casting away of Israel. God is not dealing with Israel as a nation today. They're cast aside, but they're going to be regathered <clears throat> and God is going to put them through the fire as a man puts silver in the furnace to melt out the dross. Romans 11, 25, For I would not, brethren, that you should be ignorant of this mystery, lest you should be wise in your own conceits. Uh, that blindness in part has happened to Israel until the fullness of the Gentiles be come in, and so all Israel shall be saved. As it is written, there shall come out of Zion the deliverer and shall turn away ungodliness from Jacob, for this is my covenant of them when I shall take away their sins. God is going to put Israel through the fire of judgment over here and he's going to melt the dross out of them and then the Lord is going to come to them that turn from uh, iniquity and he's going to save them and set up his kingdom and they're going into his kingdom. But how about this time in here? During this time, there is no distinction between Israel and the Gentile. There is no distinction in nations in the eyes of God anymore. God will save anybody that will come unto him by Jesus Christ. Jesus Christ was given by 